that God commands all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Jesus Christ is going to return. He's going to judge this world in righteousness. That world includes you. You'll be judged by God for your life for how you've lived your life. Some people are opposed to God's judgment. They'll say that's judgmental. God's not judgmental, which is nonsense. It's not true. But people are willing to be judged in all sorts of ways for all sorts of things. They're willing to be judged in athletics. First place, second place, last place. People are willing to be judged in classrooms by the professors, A, B, C, failure. People are going to be judged in contests according to their skills and abilities. People are willing to be judged by their peers. Oh, you look pretty tonight. Oh, that dress doesn't look good on you. People are willing to be judged in all kinds of ways every single day. But for some reason, when someone begins to talk about the judgment of God, oh, that's judgmental. Thou shall not judge. Which, of course, the Bible never says, Thou shall not judge. It says, Judge not lest you be judged. With what judgment you use, we measure back to you. That's completely different from Thou shall not judge. But God is going to judge you. Judgment day is coming. I say, Well, when's it going to come? Well, when Jesus returns. Just because I can't give you the exact date does not mean it's not going to happen. We have God's word on it. Jesus said no one knows the day or the hour of his return, but he will return. This is why his return can be called by him and by other writers of the New Testament a thief in the night. He comes when people least expect it, when they're eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, partying, going about their lives the way they want to, running their lives. He will come when they least expect it because they're not watching, they're not waiting, not taking heed to the signs that he said would happen before he returns. But there are signs of Jesus' return. And he talks about these in Matthew chapter 24. He talks about wars and rumors of wars. He says nation will rise against nation. So there'll be famines and pestilences in many places and earthquakes and other natural disasters. These are the things he said will happen before he returns. And so pestilences, that's, that's sicknesses, diseases, infestation of creatures, creatures. These things are going to happen before Jesus returns. These are the signs of his coming. He calls them the beginning of sorrows. So sorrows are coming for the sinners, and those things are just the beginning of sorrows. But so many of you are so indifferent to the truth of God's word. You're indifferent to what God's word says. You care more about Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube than you do about God's word. How do I know this? Let's look and see how, how much time you spend on those things. And how much time you spend in God's Word, how much time you spend in prayer, talking to God, hearing from God. There is a God. He created you in your mother's womb. He created all that you see. And He calls you to Himself, to a relationship with Him. And He says things like this. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, 
No drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So unrighteous people won't inherit God's kingdom. Well, here's the question. Are you righteous? If you're not righteous, the Bible makes it clear you're not going to inherit God's kingdom. If you're looking at pornography, lusting after women and men, if you're having sex outside of marriage, getting drunk, doing drugs, these are all sins in God's eyes. And God's going to hold you accountable for your actions. He's also going to hold you accountable for your thoughts. Imagine that. Cops can't arrest people for their thoughts. Because they have no idea what's going through people's minds. But God knows your thought life. He knows the secret things done in darkness. He knows all about what you think about, what you meditate upon. He's calling you to repentance of all of that. And if you love your life so much that you're not willing to repent of those things, then, okay, that's your choice. You can make those choices if you want. God's given you free will, but you don't get to choose the consequences of your choices. God has already determined that. He says this, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, shall be as stubble. The day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That's the word of God towards sinners. Here's another word of God towards sinners. When we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see? Christ died for you. He laid down his life for you. It says in another place, it says it this way, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. For all we are like sheep going astray, but now return to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Of course, the most popular verse ever known in the history of mankind is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already. He does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. When it talks about belief there, believing in, believe in Jesus, believe in the Son, and having everlasting life, it's talking about more than just mental agreement, intellectual assent. It's talking about giving your life to him. Not just believing a set of doctrinal facts, believing he existed, going to a building on Sunday you call church, and living like the devil the rest of the week. It's talking about giving your whole life to him. And in James chapter 2, and of course James was a half-brother of Jesus, lived with him most of his life, he said, you believe there is one God, you do well. So there's that faith there. And he says, even demons believe and tremble, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? This is a, he says in that same passage, if a man says he has faith but has not works, can such faith save him? Rhetorical question, completely rhetorical. Of course not. Such faith cannot save him. And he gives a couple examples in that passage to show how absurd it is to think that you can have faith and no works and say you're saved. So if you see a man who is homeless and sick and, or in need of food, and you say, be warm and well fed, and you pat him on the back, but giving nothing to help him when you have the means to do so, how does that help him? It helps him none. It also gives another example. You know, as the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without works dead. Because yeah, when someone dies, their spirit leaves them, and the body is dead. 
There's no life in it. And so faith without works is dead. There's many people here in the Bible Belt who call themselves Christian, like to fancy themselves as a Christian because they were raised in the church. Maybe they're even raised in a Christian family. They go to a church probably once, twice a week. Maybe crack, crack open their Bible on their own every once in a while and read it. And they think that by doing those things, that makes them a Christian. That's not the truth. The Bible never says such things. You're no more a Christian by going to a building on Sunday than someone is a whopper by going to Burger King. Or someone is a farmer by stepping onto a farm. It's not the way it works. Faith without works is dead. You must walk in holiness before God. The Bible says, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The scripture makes it clear. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. So anyone can claim with their mouth to be a Christian, but the question is, are they really a Christian? Are you really a Christian if you claim to be one? 1 John 3:18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this, we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So how do you know you're in the truth? How do you get assurance in your heart that you're a child of God? You bear fruit. Your actions prove your life, because anyone can say with their mouth, I'm a child of God. In fact, in Matthew 7, end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about these group of people. He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we not prophesy your name, do many wonders in your name, and cast out demons in your name. And he will say to them, away from me, you evildoers, I never knew you. So many people on that day who will say they know Jesus and they even say they did things in his name, but he says, I never knew you. You're a worker of sin. So take heed, beware, test yourself, examine yourself to see if you're truly in the faith. Some people rest their, their assurance, their security on praying a sinner's prayer. You know, saying certain words in a prayer to Jesus or asking Jesus into their heart or repeating a prayer after somebody else back when they were young. And they rest their assurance for salvation in such things. But where does the Bible give you assurance like that? Where does Jesus give you assurance like that? Nowhere. Nowhere in the scriptures he give you assurance like that. If you want assurance of salvation, the proof's in the pudding. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, it says this, Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. You see, so many people can say they know Jesus, they know the Lord, but they're prove, proven to be liars because they don't actually obey him. That's what the scripture says. This may be foreign to many of you. You may never have heard these things before. That's probably because you're not reading your Bible. Or you're being led by a pastor who doesn't care enough for your soul to tell you the truth. Some may say, well, that's just doctrines of men that say you need to live holy. That's work salvation. Well, First Thessalonians says this. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his holy spirit. You see, this is a doctrine that comes from God who gives us the Holy Spirit. You see, he's a holy spirit, not an unholy spirit. And Christian doctrine teaches from the scripture that 
when someone becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, they, call, they become what's called born again. And in John 3, Jesus defines what that means. He said you're born of the Spirit. The Spirit of God comes and lives inside of you when you repent of your sins and believe upon Jesus by faith. But he's a Holy Spirit. And do you think the Holy Spirit is going to dwell in someone who is living an unholy, unholy life? Of course not. The Holy Spirit will only dwell in someone who lives a holy life. The Bible says in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Some may say, well, I love God. I may not obey God, but I love him. Well, 1 John 5, 3 says, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. You see? That's how you know you love God. Jesus even said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then in verse 21, he says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is what the Scripture teaches about those who follow Jesus. But my experience over 15 years of college campus preaching, whether in the South, the North, or the Midwest, or the Far West, or the Northwest, or the Northeast, is that most students are not followers of Jesus. They live in an environment that's completely anti-Bible, anti-Christ. There's professors, the curriculum, the books, their peers, the extracurricular activities that go on, completely anti-Christ for the most part, to promote sin. And God is against sin. You know, as I said earlier, Jesus was sent to destroy the works of the devil. He wasn't sent to empower you to keep on doing the works of the devil and be forgiven every time you do it. That's not what Jesus came to do. And Jesus came to give you life. And the wages of sin is death. So they don't, Jesus and sin don't match up. They don't go together. Jesus came into the world to deal with sin. John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus came to take away sin, to deliver from sin. And he wants to deliver you from the power of darkness and convey you into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. See, but forgiveness of sins is only available to someone who repents, who turns away from sin. Repent doesn't mean feel sorry about something and keep on doing it. Repent means to turn away from it, to forsake it, to give it up, to go the other way, to make a 180 degree turn. That's what it means to repent of sin. Most of you claim, many of you have claimed to repent of your sin, but you keep on doing it. That's not repentance. The Bible says, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation not to be regretted but the sorrow of the world produces death and then it goes on to talk about the characteristics of those who have truly repented with godly sorrow for consider this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner what diligence it produced in you what clearing of yourself what indignation what fear what vehement desire what zeal what vindication in all things you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. See, someone who truly repents of sin, they don't just feel bad about it. That's just your conscience. When you feel bad about sin, that's just your conscience. That doesn't mean you repented. Feeling bad about sin means you haven't seared your conscience to the point where you don't feel bad anymore. That doesn't mean you've repented of sin. Repentance means to turn away from it. 
Jews like this in John 5, 14, he said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing happen to you. So he sent it to a man he had just healed, who he was lame for 38 years, and he just had disappeared after he had healed him. He saw him later on. He said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing happen to you. Something worse than being lame, not being able to walk for 38 years would happen to the man if he went back to his sin. So Jesus told him to sin no more. Not sin some more, not sin a little bit more, not just try to stop sinning but keep on failing, but sin no more. That's what Jesus said. And that's what he commands you to do. The Bible says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out. That times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. You know, he offers you pardon. He offers you times of refreshing. He offers to blot out your sins and the consequences of them. But you must repent. You must be converted. Fornicators, those having sex outside of marriage, will not inherit God's kingdom. Those getting drunk will not inherit God's kingdom. Those telling lies, stealing, or being covetous will not inherit God's kingdom. Those looking with lust or watching pornography will not inherit God's kingdom. The only way such people could ever inherit God's kingdom is to change their mind about their sin, turn from their sin, forsake their sin, and go the other way concerning their sin and walk with Jesus instead, for he is holy. And he expects you to be holy. In 1 Peter 1, the Bible says, as obedient children, not conforming yourself to your former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. But if you call upon the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's works, conduct yourself at the time of your stay here in fear, knowing you are not redeemed from your aimless conduct handed down by tradition from your fathers, but gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, it's a land without blemish, without spot. That's what God calls you to, to be, obe to be an obedient child, to all, for all your lust to be former, to be holy as he is holy, to realize exactly what it is that you've been redeemed from and what you've been redeemed to and what you've been redeemed by. And God wants to redeem you from your sin, all of your sin. He wants to redeem you to transformational power and walking in holiness and obedience. And you're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And if someone would just get that down, the price that Jesus paid to redeem you from your sin, to deliver you from your sin, and most people just got that part down, it would stop them from sinning. If they really love God, it would stop them from sinning. It would stop them from being fornicators, having sex outside of marriage, stop them from being drunkards and pot smokers and liars and thieves and having a filthy mouth. That fact alone would break their heart. But if you're still in sin and you know about what Jesus did for you on a cross, then you don't esteem the sacrifices of Jesus Christ. You, you reproach it. You reproach his sacrifices. But his sacrifices were great. He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement for your peace was upon him. And by his stripes you can be healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Yes, Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. That's the great love of God, the cross. 
by laying down his life for you and for your sins. He didn't commit any sin. He had done nothing wrong, but he died for you. That's sacrificial. That's loving right there. He didn't lay his life down for his friends, but for his enemies, for those who behave wickedly. Jesus Christ died for the ungodly, for drunkards, for pot smokers, for those with filthy mouths, for lustful people, for homosexuals, for sodomites. These are the ones she has died for. But when they come, when someone that his name comes to realize what Jesus did from the cross, and they give their life to him, it changes them. It transforms them. As the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. It's called becoming born again. That's what God wants me. He wants you to become born again. And in God's kingdom, it's not just about, about becoming born again. There's other benefits in God's kingdom. He rewards, he rewards the righteous when he comes in his kingdom. And in his kingdom, the Bible says this in Revelation 21.4. It says, there shall be no more, for he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. You see, when Jesus comes in his kingdom, things are going to change. Sin is going to be dealt with. There'll be no injustice, no unfairness. Jesus will deal with things properly. And he will judge in righteousness. He won't judge on a curve. He won't play favorites. He will judge in righteousness. But for those who give their life to him and live for him, in this world there's tribulation, there's trouble, there's difficulties. But when he comes, those things will come to an end. As I said, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. You think about just this week, how many times you've been in pain or had sorrow, or you cried, or maybe there's heartbreak in your life. When Jesus comes in his kingdom, those things will be done away with. Those things will be gone. Because the cause of all those things is sin. And Jesus doesn't deal with the, the branches of an issue. He deals with the root of the issue. And the root of the issue is men's sin. See, all cause in this world of death, sorrow, crying, pain, is sin. Sin is the cause of all those things. And when Jesus comes, he's going to deal with sin. He's going to abolish sin. And there'll be no more crying, no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. For the former things have passed away. That's what Jesus Christ offers his followers when he comes in his kingdom. The devil doesn't offer you those things. The devil offers you the exact opposite. More death more sorrow, more crying, more pain. In fact, if you continue to follow the devil and continue to follow sin, you'll end up in hell forever. There'll be no, there'll be pain forever and ever. You'll never cease to be in pain. You'll never cease being in pain again. Jesus talks about this in Mark 9. He talks about where the worm does not die and the fire is never quenched, never put out. See, hell is a place, it's God's judgment place, and it's always going to be there. It will never cease to be there. Those who go there will not be able to get out. There'll be no exits, no fire exits out of hell, no fire extinguishers, no fire departments, no fire hydrants, no sprinkler system, none of those things. It's God's jail cell for sinners who refuse to repent and do as he has told them to do. And it's God's mercy and God's compassion 
that saves anybody from their sin, that saves anybody from damnation, anybody from the judgment of God, the common condemnation of God. It's God's mercy, His compassion. For He's a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. How do we know he's slowed to anger besides the fact that the Bible says it? Well, just think about your life. Think about just how many times you've sinned against God already in your life. Maybe just today. Maybe this week. You know, people average sinning three times a day. Over one year, that's over a thousand sins against God. Over five years, five thousand sins. Ten years, ten thousand sins. They sin for... 70 years, 70,000 sins. The average person lived to be about 75 years old. It's the average person God allows them to live through over 70,000 sins. And that's a very small number, very conservative number. Probably actually much higher, probably three times as high as that. But he still allows you to live even though you sin against him day in and day out. You offend him day in and day out. He still allows you to live. That's proof positive that God is patient. God is merciful. But you need to understand. Don't uh, despise the patience of God. Don't abuse the patience of God. Because the patience of God will run out eventually. Eventually, God will say, that's enough for each person, whether it's them dying in their sins or it's Jesus Christ returning in judgment to punish people for their sins. Those are the two options people have. There's no way around it. You will stand before Jesus Christ to give an account of your life. What will you do then? What will you do then? You have nowhere to hide. You know, when Jesus returns, mighty men, rich men, kings will say, say to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? You see, even mighty men, rich men, these men who the world esteems, whom God does not esteem, because they're just men, they will say to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us when Jesus returns. Revelation 6 talks about this at the sixth seal. People will do. Don't think to yourself so bold, so prideful, so brazen that you'll stand before God as a sinner and be okay. Not true. You need to repent while you still can. Turn from your sin. Stop playing games with your eternity. Stop playing games with your soul. Give up your sin. Follow Jesus Christ. He is holy, and he commands you to be holy. In fact, in Matthew 5, 48, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking to thousands of sinners. He says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, what does he mean by that? He doesn't mean perfect in intellect, perfect physically, perfect never making mistakes, but perfect morally. The good you know you ought to do, you're doing it. The bad you should not do, that you know you should not do, you don't do it. That's what it means to be perfect in God's sight. In fact, in the scripture, we have men like Job. This is the genealogy of Job. Job was a just man. He was a just man. He was blameless. He was upright. One who feared God and shunned evil. So there's a man in the land of us whose name was Job. That man feared God. He was blameless. He was upright. One who feared God and shunned evil. That's Job. And you have Noah. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect. In his generations, Noah walked with God. So you have men in Scripture who give example, their examples to us of how we should live our lives. Hell sounds kind of fun if all those people are no, there'll be no fun in hell centers. Party's been canceled. You can't have a party when you're on fire. 
There'll be no smoking weed while you're on fire, getting drunk while you're on fire, no fornicating when you're on fire. There's no fun in hell. But you're gonna be in you know, isolation anyway. You're not gonna be with all your friends hanging out, da dirty dancing. You'll be on fire. It's God's judgment. It's God's jail cell for sinners. But right now, you have a chance at mercy. Right now, you have an opportunity to have God's mercy. That's only right now. The Bible says today is a day of salvation. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Submit to God. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God and he will lift you up. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That's the, that's the mercy of God right there, the pardon of God. For those who will seek him and turn from their sins and their wicked ways and believe upon him in faith, he will have mercy on them. But for those who refuse to repent, who refuse to turn in faith to Jesus Christ, who is the only way, the only truth, the only life, the only way to the Father, then you'll get what you deserve in the end. The Bible says God has given him a name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Nor is there salvation in any other for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You must be saved by Jesus. And Jesus will only save those who repent and believe upon him in faith. Those are the only ones Jesus will save. Everyone else is going to be damned to hell on judgment day. Jesus said, repent or perish. And those are your only options. There is no middle option. There's no purgatory. Maybe some Roman Catholics here. There are no, there's no purgatory. No such thing as purgatory. You'll be judged for your sins. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. Also, the wicked shall be turned into hell in every nation that forgets God. Unfortunately, this nation as a whole has forgotten God. It's been given over to violence and rioting and looting and lies and deceptions. It's a shame what this nation has become. Now, it's never been a Christian nation in my estimation. But what it's becoming, what it has become, is an abomination to God. God says, I hate the hands that shed innocent blood. We're one of the most prolific nations in the world in killing unborn babies. They're babies. It's life from conception. And therefore, when you terminate a little boy or a little girl in their mother's womb, whether through poisonous pill, vacuum aspiration, partial birth abortion, or tearing them limb from limb, it's all murder. Abortion is murder. Now, if you've had an abortion, there is mercy available for you from God. God isn't, like God's grace is not good enough to save someone from killing somebody else. There's mercy available for that. If you repent and give your life to Jesus, just like any other sin, we need to understand this is, this is wickedness where 60 million babies have been killed since Roe versus Wade. And God is not happy about that. 
That's like one sixth of our current po total population in America. One sixth. Seventeen percent. So over the last 60, 70 years, 17% of our population has been killed off by their own mothers and fathers. The mothers turned to murderers and fathers turned to cowards. It's a shame. God calls people to be responsible parents, not indifferent, apathetic, selfish monsters who kill their own children. But that's abortion for you. It's wicked. It's one of the evils of our nation. The Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. The scripture says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You see, so righteousness exalts a nation in God's sight, but sin is a reproach to any people. Whether the sin is the LGBT movement, or the sin is abortion, or the sin is violence and destruction of private property, or the sin is sex outside of marriage and pornography, and lust, all these sins bring reproach upon us as a nation and upon you as an individual if you are the one committing it. But there's hope in Jesus. There's hope in Jesus. Jesus died for sinners. He laid down his life for sinners. Now the facts have come out from the CDC about the coronavirus. We know that really 6% of those who are counted as dead from coronavirus have been killed by the actual coronavirus. There are 94% have comorbidities. So we're talking about about 9,000 people total in the U.S. have died from the coronavirus. 9,000. The flu on a bad year will kill about 60,000. On a less lightweight year, kill about 10,000 people. The coronavirus hasn't even met that yet. Yet people walk around like they're going to die. 9,000 out of 350 million, 360 million people is nothing. It's nothing. It's more of a pandemic than a pandemic. And people are overreacting. They walk around with muzzles on, trying to protect themselves from a virus that really probably can't kill them in most cases. You know, we got to be a good, obedient little citizens and put our mask on everywhere we go, our muzzles. It's absurd. It really is. So people will walk around and they'll put their mask on trying to protect themselves from a virus. So they'll most likely never give them a symptom. But when I talk about Judgment Day, they're apathetic. They ignore. Let me just tell you this. Judgment Day is 100% guaranteed to happen. 100% guaranteed to happen. The coronavirus, very small chance it'll ever even give you a symptom, even if you do get it. Yes, so many of you walk around with your muzzles on, but you won't consider your soul. You won't consider your eternity. You won't consider where you'll spend eternity. It's a shame. And you care more about this very weak, lightweight virus. Now, when people do get it and they have comorbidities, it's very serious. But for most of us, it's not very serious at all. And so many of you, you are so concerned about it, you're fretting over it, you're fearful about it, but you don't fear God. You don't fear His judgment, which are guaranteed. Judgment, the judgment of God is guaranteed to come to pass. It's guaranteed to happen. What are you doing about that? What are you doing to protect yourself from that. Now, if you feared God and feared sin and feared hell as much as you feared this dumb virus, we'd have revival in this nation. But most of you, you, you fear this little virus has a very small chance of even ever giving you a symptom, let alone killing you. But sin, the wages of sin, is death. You get that? The wages of sin is death. 
but you don't care about your sin. Do you see the irony there? You don't care about your sin and where it's going to send you to hellfire, but you care about this weak little virus and you walk, walk around with your muscles on to protect you from it. And they'll even protect you from it. The mask you're wearing, the virus goes right through it. Doesn't even protect you or anyone else from it. It's all nonsense. Do I care for your soul? And no matter how you die, whether it's from the coronavirus or it's from drugs or a car accident or just old age or cancer or whatever, you're going to stand before God. Guaranteed. God said so. What are you doing about it? What are you, I mean, are you at least taking as much steps as you are to protect yourself from this virus? You walk around all day, every day with a mask on. You social distance. How about you social distance yourself from sin? How about you fear God in hell enough to the right precautions to repent of sin and turn in faith to Jesus? Flee the wrath to come. Turn to Jesus by faith. Obey him, follow him, serve him. He is your only hope. And even if you never get coronavirus, you never have a symptom, you never contract it, you don't die from it, the fact is, someday you're going to die. Unless you're alive when Jesus returns, you are going to die. That's a fact of the matter. You can't escape that. No matter how many masks you wear, no matter what precautions you take, you are going to die. You're going to stand before God. What are you doing about that? The Bible says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Let us hear the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Yeah, people care more about a virus than they do about sin more about a virus than they do about hell, more about a virus than they do about Judgment Day. What a shame. What a shame. The CDC has lied over and over again. WHO lied over and over again. China lied over and over again about this whole thing. And you walk around with your muscles on, but you won't repent and turn to Jesus, and Jesus is the truth. He never lied, never will lie. God's not a man that he should lie. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's calling you to repentance. He changes not. Men change. Seasons change. God does not change. The Bible says the flowers fade. We're getting close to fall now. So it feels like summer. We're getting closer to fall. The flowers fade and the grass withers but the Word of God endures forever. So the Word of God doesn't change. It endures forever. It's attached to His character. The Word of God is attached to His character. It's who He is. He declares to us who He is, what He's like. He tells you all about yourself and what He expects out of you. He tells us what happened in the past. He tells us what's going to happen in the future. And we can believe it because it's God's Word and He does not lie. Most of you lie every single day, multiple times a day. God has never told one lie. Neither has Jesus. You know, if your friend was lying to you over and over again, you found out about it, you probably would stop trusting them. You found out your friend was always telling you the truth, even if it was difficult for you to hear, even if it was quote unquote hurtful to hear from them. Who would you trust more, that person or someone who lies to you all the time and tells you comforting words, smooth words, kisses of deceit, hugs of hell? Who would you believe? The person who tells you the unscathed truth, even when he didn't want to hear it? Or the person who lies to you with smooth words? Yes, the wounds of a friend are faithful, the Bible says. But the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. There's very few people in this world 
who will tell you the truth no matter what. Very few people in this world who will tell you the truth no matter what. The truth you need to hear, not what you want to hear, not what is pleasing to your flesh, but what the truth actually is. Very few people will do that. I'm here to tell you the truth today. I'm here to tell you what God's Word says. The truth is, sinners will not inherit God's kingdom. The unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom. God is calling all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. That's the truth. Your intellect, your degrees, your money, your pride, your possessions will not get you anywhere with God on Judgment Day. You need righteousness. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Want to be delivered from death? Want to be delivered from hell? Repent. Turn in faith to Jesus. Obey him, serve him, follow him. That's what he commands you to do. And on Judgment Day, there'll be no excuses. You can't say, I was born this way. I couldn't help it. My parents taught me this way. Society was this way. Most of my friends were this way. You'll have no excuse. You actually have more access to the truth in our day and age. There's more access to the Bible in our day and age than ever before. Most of you have a pocket computer, smartphone, is what it's called. You have a little computer in your pocket. You have access to the Word of God at all times. I wonder if we put that app on your phone that would see how much time you spend on each app, how much time you've spent on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and TikTok and whatever else there is out there, and how much time you spent with God, how much you spent in God's Word. It's important. The Bible is important. The most important book there ever was is the Bible. It's God's Word. It's his, his love letter to humanity. But you despise it, you reject it, you ignore it, you let it collect dust on your shelf. It's shame. There's people all around the world who would love to have the access to the truth that you have here in America. You know, there's people in China, underground believers in Jesus, who don't even have a Bible. And when Bibles get delivered to them, they swarm on the box of books like the greatest treasure they ever found has been given to them. And they hug it and kiss it. I know it's God's word, you know how important, how precious it is. When a tribe of people who doesn't have the Bible in their language finally gets the Bible translated into language, they have a party, a celebration welcoming the Bible in their language into their tribe, their town. But yet here in America, we have so many uh, super abundance of English translations of the Bible catering to all kinds of people in all different ways. And some of the Bibles are false, not even really the Bible. But it's so much access to the truth. You have no excuse for all your access to the truth and your ignoring of it your apathy towards it. What are you doing with the truth of God's Word? Are you reading it? Are you believing it? Are you studying it? Are you obeying it? These are the important questions you must ask yourself. The Word of God should take precedence over your science books. The Word of God should take precedence over your history books. The Word of God should take precedence over your math books, your psychology books, your sociology books. The Word of God takes precedence. In fact, if you read the Word of God, you'd probably throw some of those books in the garbage where they belong. If they teach things that are anti-God, anti-biblical, anti-truth, really. But the Word of God has stood the test of time. It's the best-selling book of all time, the most read book of all time. And so many of you, you'll, you'll go to a, go somewhere to a list and find the most read books and you'll pick them up and read them, but you'll forget about the Bible because it's left off the list and you don't care about God's Word. 
If you cared about God's word, you'd read it. You'd believe it. You'd study it. You'd obey it. You'd immerse yourself in it. You'd memorize it. You'd meditate upon it. Just like God tells you to. When God's word, the Bible, is left on your shelf to collect dust and you put it aside and you barely ever read it, if ever, you're in danger. You're in danger of dying going to hell. You're in danger of being sorely deceived. Because the only objective, absolute standard of truth is the Bible. It's the one book you test every other book against. The Bible is God's word. And if you don't know what the Bible says, you don't read the Bible for yourself and study it for yourself and believe it and obey it, you're going to end up deceived. And that's one of those things Jesus talked about in the last days, that false teachers, false prophets, false Christ will arise to deceive many. And the one way you can prevent yourself from being deceived is by immersing yourself in the truth and knowing it so well Reading it so often, uh, there's no way you could possibly be deceived. Obeying it so thoroughly that you won't fall for any of the schemes of the enemy of your soul. That's the devil himself. Jesus said in Matthew 7, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way which leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So there are few who find life. Many find death. Many find destruction. There's few who find life. In other passages of scripture, Jesus talks about the same concept to those who enter the kingdom of God, take it by violence, take it by force. In other words, I do whatever it takes to make sure they're in the kingdom of God. But in Matthew 6, he just talks about sin. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. What's more profitable for you that one of your members perish and for your whole body to be cast into hell. He goes on to say the same thing about your hand and about your foot. Many of you are sitting with your eyes, with your hand, with your feet, with your hands and feet. And Jesus isn't endorsing, literally endorsing mutilation in these passages. He's using hyperbole to prove a point. Simply put, take extreme measures. Do whatever it takes to get sin out of your life. Why? It's going to cost you your soul. It's going to cost you your eternity. But if you'll turn from your sin and turn in faith to Jesus, you can have eternal life. For the grace of God, which brings salvation, has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking forward to the blessed hope and glorious appearing of a great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So he wants to save you by his grace. And when someone truly gets saved by grace, their life is changed. They live a holy, sober, righteous, and godly life in this present age. They've been redeemed, delivered from every lawless deed. They look forward to the return of Jesus Christ. They are zealous for good works. They are a special people in God's eyes. Those are the characteristics of someone who's been saved by grace. Being saved by grace doesn't mean you pray to sinner's prayer, Asked Jesus into your heart, went to church, got dipped in some water. That's not salvation. Now, someone who gets saved, they will call upon the name of the Lord, and oftentimes it'll be in prayer, and they will get baptized, at least eventually they will, as soon as they're able to and they know about it. 
But those things in and of themselves don't save anybody. Many of you, you trust in those things. But they don't save you. You need righteousness. And since Jesus was perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, he is the perfect sacrifice for sins. The perfect substitute for sinners. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, he got what he didn't deserve, so that if you repent of your sin and trust in him, you'll get what you don't deserve, his mercy and his grace. But if you refuse to turn to Jesus by faith and turn from your sins, then you will get what you deserve in the end. You will receive upon yourself God's judgment, God's punishment, God's consequences for you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 says this, when Christ returns with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These he shall punish with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. This is what Jesus will do when he returns. Another name for hell in the scripture is Tophet, for Tophet was established of old, Isaiah 30. For Tophet, hell, was established of old. Yes, for the king it is prepared. He has made it deep and large. Its pyre is fire with much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. Yeah, so hell is God's hell. It's not the devil's hell. The devil is not in control of hell. He doesn't rule over hell. He doesn't have a pitchfork and horns in the tail. The devil himself will be in hell. Hell is God's hell. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindled it. And it's been made for him, for the king. It was prepared. And he made it deep and large. It's deep and large enough that it can, it can fit anyone who wants to go there, there. Anyone who doesn't want to be a part of God's kingdom, who doesn't want to receive his grace and mercy, who does not want eternal life, it's big enough for all of them. All who want to be drunkards and fornicators and porn watchers and liars and thieves. All who want to, you know, do drugs. All who want to be covetous. All who want to be idolaters, those who worship gods that are false and fake and idols. All such people will not inherit God's kingdom. You know, the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 6 that no idolater will inherit the kingdom of God. It's talking about all the false religions. For example, Islam is a false religion. Islam is not truth. Islam is idolatry. Islam does not worship and serve the God of the scriptures the God of the Bible, the God of Jesus. They have a fake Jesus in their religion that does not exist. It's a figment of Muhammad's imagination or the devil who revealed it to him. So Islam is a false religion. Islam is idolatry. And those who practice such will not inherit God's kingdom. Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, same boat. Idolatry. They're idol worshipers. The God they serve does not exist. The God of Mormonism teaches that Elohim, the God of our planet, was once a human on another planet. So the Bible teaches the Bible teaches that God has always been God. There's none before him, none after him. So that whatever God said that he couldn't have a God after him, and there was no God before him. That's what it teaches. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that. Jesus is the archangel Michael. This is not true either. He's the son of God and God in the flesh. He's Emmanuel, God with us. King of kings and Lord of lords, the prince of peace, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. That's Jesus Christ. He doesn't have a beginning. He's not an angel in that sense, the archangel Michael. Roman Catholicism is false as well. It's that Mary is the co-redeemer. You can pray to other people besides God. And they'll pray to God for you. Scripture does not teach these things. 
They, they say that uh, Jesus is literally present in every Eucharist. Not true. So the scriptures make it clear that Jesus Christ is the only way. Hinduism is followed with its millions of gods. It leads to hell. And even people, the greatest idol in America that people worship and will go to hell for worshiping, they call him Jesus, but he's not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of their imagination, Jesus who's not judgmental, Jesus who accepts everyone the way they are, Jesus that makes people sinners and they can't help it. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus of the Bible is holy, and he expects you to be holy. And because he's holy, and he expects you to be holy, he won't make people as sinners, because he wants people to not be sinners. Some people, they oftentimes will believe things like, oh, homosexuals are born that way. They can't help it. Absolutely not. It's not a truth. In the Bible, it's called a choice. It's like every other sin is a choice. Sodomy is a choice. Being a homosexual, being a lesbian, being a bisexual, being a transsexual, being a transvestite, getting your private parts chopped up, that's all choices, all wicked choices that God is against, God is not pleased with, and God will never be pleased with such things. But God's never made a man in a woman's body, or a woman in a man's body, never made a homosexual, never will. If I had no other proof that this is proof, God condemns people for doing those things. And God is just, God is fair, he'll never condemn someone for being what he made them to be. And that's proof positive, this is saying as someone being born a certain type of sin, or a certain type of sinner. What people like that they undergo, they undergo temptations, oftentimes demonic spiritual temptations. But temptation itself is not a sin. And Jesus was tempted at all points, like we are, yet without sin. So temptation itself is not a sin. But the scripture teaches in 1 Corinthians 10 that no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So when temptation comes, there's always a way out. It's not too much for you to handle with God's help, and it can be overcome every single time. The problem is, many of you don't care about resisting or overcoming temptation. You simply just give into it over and over again. That's, that doesn't bother you at all. But giving into temptation is a death wish because the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Your sin will lead to your death. Not just physical death now, but eternal death. Separation from God for all eternity in the lake of fire, his judgment place. That's what will, that's what will become of sinners. So God calls sinners to repent. He calls sinners to go and sin no more. If you, God's not far from any one of us. Acts 17 talks about this. Where you were born, who you were born to, what time you were born, the parents who you have, those were all God's choosing for you. You had no choice in those things. And the Bible says in Acts 17 that God picked, picked those things for you, chose those things for you, in the hope that you might grope for him and find him, though he's not far for any one of us. So God's desire for you, no matter where you were born, who you were born to, how you were born, who your parents are, is that you would seek after God and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. See, God's not playing hide and seek with sinners. He's out in the open. He tells them exactly who he is, how he can be found, what sinners need to do to start a relationship with him. The Bible says, repent therefore and be converted, that your sins might be blotted out, that times of refreshing might come from the presence 
of the Lord. God offers you times of refreshing. He offers you relationship with him through the blood of Jesus, through what he did for you at the cross. He offers you mercy. That's the only way any sinner can ever be saved or receive help is by the mercy of God, by the grace of God. Do you have the mercy of God today? Do you have the grace of God today? You can know by looking at your life, examining your life. Jesus said you should know a tree by its fruit. He said even make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. A tree is known by its fruit. His brutal vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say unto you that for every idle word men may speak, they give account of in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. You know, the reason why those who are not saved are not saved is not because you have an inability it's not because you necessarily have a lack of understanding. It's simply because you have a lack of willingness. A lack of willingness to turn from your sin. You love your sin too much. You love your sex outside of marriage, your porn watching, your lust, your other sexual immorality, your drunkenness, your pot smoking, your pride, your lying, your stealing, all your sin that is the reason why you won't get saved. Because you love it too much. You're a sin-loving God-hater. Instead, you become a God-loving sin-hater. It was said of Jesus in Hebrews 1, he loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. And you're called to be like Christ. For the Christian is someone who's like Christ. He loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Is that you? Do you love righteousness? Do you hate lawlessness? Or do you cling to your sin? Cling to your wickedness? And cling to it straight to the grave? The Bible talks about this. A generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. A generation that is pure in its own eyes, it is not washed from its filthiness. Who teaches that? Is that what your generation is like? You think you're clean before God, but you're actually wicked? You think you know better than the past generations? You know, rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Many of you may not be involved in sorcery and casting spells and being full of demons, but you rebel against authority. And I'm not talking about you know, bad authority or ungodly. I'm talking about just authority in general. Anarchy and anarchists are growing in America. You see it all the time. You see it in Portland. You see it in Chicago. You see it in New York. Anarchy is growing all over us. They despise authority. That's why they despise the police, despise um, the federal government and what they stand for. And a lot of these local governments just sit and bowing down and giving into it because they're cowards and weak and won't do what it takes to do their job. But if you're a rebel against authority, rebel against your parents, your mother, your father, the authorities God has placed in your life, when they tell you something good and right and you rebel against them and think you know better and you're full of pride, the Bible says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So which are you? Are you humble? Or are you prideful? God opposes the proud. God is against the proud. 
but God gives grace to the humble. And the Bible says, for by grace you have been saved, not of works, not of yourself, lest any man should boast. The only way you can be saved is by grace. In order to receive grace, you must be humble. You must see yourself in truth. You must see yourself as you truly are, as a sinner in need of a savior. And that is your only hope in the end, is turning to Jesus in faith, turning to Jesus Christ in love. These days, people think just about anything is love. Love is approving of everybody's sin and not telling them they're wrong. Love is accepting someone just the way they are, even if they're wicked. Love is feelings, love is tolerance. Those things aren't love. Love is wanting the greatest good for somebody. And the greatest good for every single one of you today, within the sound of my voice, the greatest good for you, that you turn from sin, and you turn in faith to Jesus Christ, and begin to live a holy life unto God. And if you do those things and persevere unto the end, you will have eternal life in the end. If you laugh at sin, the Bible calls you a fool. Fools mock at sin, the Bible says. Fools mock at sin. You laugh at sin, you laugh at your own demise. It's like someone having cancer and laughing about cancer. Ha, 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 cancer. It's foolish. You know, sin's going to be your, the end of you. It's going to cost you your soul, your eternity. Something to weep over. Something to mourn over. Something to be sober about. Something to repent of. Something to laugh about and continue in and make light of. Well, sin will cost you everything in the end. But God, he offers you life. Jesus came to give life and life in abundance. Everything good comes down from the Father. James 1 talks about that. But many of you, instead of following Jesus, instead of obeying God, you obey the devil and continue to sin. The Bible says, he who sins is of a devil. And this, the children of God, the children of the devil are manifest. For it is not love, righteousness is not of God. The Bible makes it clear, he that commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave will not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. As the son wants to set you free, free from sin. Not just free from the judgment and the consequences of your sin, but free from sin itself. Now listen, when you're free from sin itself and you've turned to Jesus, you automatically get the byproduct of being set free from the condemnation and judgment and the consequences of your sin. The guilt and shame of your sin. Because many of you I know, you'd love to be free from the guilt and shame of your sin, but not the actual practice of your sin. You don't want to feel bad about your sin. You just want to do it without, with it, in peace. But the Bible says there is no peace with God for the ungodly. There is no peace with God for the ungodly. You'll never find true peace in this world if you continue in sin. It's only by turning from sin and turning in faith to Jesus Christ that you can truly find peace. It's the only way you can truly find joy, too. An old preacher said, and I agree with him, that entertainment is a devil's substitute for joy. That's why so many of you, you entertain yourselves to death on YouTube, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, on TikTok, on WhatsApp, whatever else there is out there. You entertain yourself to death. Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, you binge watch whole seasons of something to entertain yourself because you're lacking joy. And joy only comes from salvation in Jesus. True peace only comes through salvation in Jesus. 
Joy and peace will not come any other way. Will not come by doing good deeds. Will not come through entertainment. Will not come through going to a building or some kind of religion. True joy and true peace only come through salvation in Jesus, through, through a relationship with Jesus Christ, through knowing Him. It's the only way you'll ever have true joy and peace. Many of you rather have your fake joy, your fake peace, your good feelings, your laughter, which only lasts for a short time, does not to continue, is not based upon the sure foundation of Jesus Christ, the rock of ages. And if you're building your house upon those kind of things, you're building your house, your life upon sinking sand. Instead, you need to build your house upon the rock, which is hearing the word of God and obeying it. That's truly building yourself upon the rock. But when you build your, pal your house upon the philosophies of this world, the wicked thoughts of this world, the wicked ideas of this world, you'll never have true joy and true peace. You won't. And the one who can offer you these things, you reject, you neglect, you couldn't care about, couldn't care less about, Jesus. But he's the same one who's going to return. He's the same one who has a name above every name, the name by which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, they might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, who died for all of those who live, should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again who desires to deliver you from the power of darkness and convey you into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. True redemption is found in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. Not anything else, not a movement, not a set of doctrines, not in a church, not any other person, not in doing good deeds, salvation is found in Jesus. Won't you turn to Jesus Christ today? Want to believe upon him by faith and do as he calls you to do and walk in his ways? Won't you do that starting today? He's calling you to repentance. If you're under conviction of your sin and see your need for Jesus Christ, He's as close as you crying out to him in prayer, calling out to him in repentance, saying, Lord, I, I turn from all my sin. I don't want to do these things anymore. I want to live for you. I want to obey you and believing upon Jesus by faith. And then if you do those things in sincerity and gen genuineness, he'll, he'll give you the Holy Spirit. You'll become born again. And then your first step of obedience will be to get baptized. Then begin to read the Bible, the Word of God, believe it, obey it find a Bible-believing church and walk in his ways the rest of your days, being a witness for him, sharing your testimony, sharing the truth with others as God commands you to. You see, I believe what the Bible says. I believe eternal life is found in Jesus Christ alone. And because I believe that, and because I believe I have eternal life, Therefore, I offer it to others. If Jesus Christ really is the only way to salvation, how dare I hold it back from everybody else? That's extreme selfishness to know the way of salvation, the way of eternal life, and to hold it back and not offer it to others. And so many of those who profess to be Christians are just cowards. They care more about what men think about them than what God thinks about them. They fear man and don't fear God. And if you don't like the truth of my sign, it doesn't change the facts. 
my sign is based upon the word of God, therefore it is true. Whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you shake your head no or shake your head yes, whether you give a thumbs up or give the middle finger, won't change the facts. God will not change for you. Instead, he calls you to change. God commands you to change. He commands all men everywhere to repent. God will not repent. He calls you to repent. God will not change his character. God will not change his standards to make it easier for you to enter into his kingdom. No, his word has been written down, has been spoken, and he will not change it. It endures forever. So many people, they'll read the Bible and they want to make their own religion. They'll take a black marker, so to speak, if not physically, literally, but metaphorically. They'll cross out certain parts of the Bible and make it say, make it say what they want it to say. They'll change things like homosexual and make it something like a male prostitute. No, homosexuals will not inherit God's kingdom. Either with sodomites, or lesbians, or transvestites, or people who chop up their body parts. They will not inherit God's kingdom. It's the truth. You can believe it or disbelieve it. You can accept it or reject it, but you can't change the facts. Truth is truth. And truth's name is Jesus. He said, I am the truth. The Bible says all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge is found in Christ. It doesn't mean that people can't have knowledge or wisdom without believing in Jesus, but it means that they're rejecting the very foundation of wisdom and knowledge is Jesus, and therefore they're being illogical and inconsistent at the least. That's just like sinners to be that way. It's just like sinners to be inconsistent and illogical and to do what they want to do instead of what God tells them to do. The Bible tells you to fear God. You say, I don't fear God, I love God. As if they are against each other. They're not against each other. If you grew up in a godly household where your parents disciplined you when you did what was wrong and encouraged you when you did what was right, you understand that love and fear are not opposites. Because you would probably fear doing wrong and getting in trouble the consequences of your actions and disappointing your parents. But at the same time, you knew they loved you. And one of the ways they showed their love was by disciplining you when you did what was wrong. God's the same way. He calls people to fear him. In fact, fearing God and keeping his commandments is man's all. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That's what the scripture teaches. Also, the fear of God is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. See, you, you might despise the fear of God. You can despise it all you like. But it's a fountain of life to turn you away from the snares of death. Also, the fear of God is clean, enduring forever. See, it's clean. Fear of God is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. In our day and age, gold's value is going up and up, so is silver's value is going up and up. And the finer the gold, the finer the silver, the purer the gold or silver, the more valuable it is. And the Bible says that the judgments of God are more valuable than fine gold. But how many, would you, how many of you would trade fine gold for God's judgment upon your life? You can tell a lot about a person by how they receive judgment, how they receive correction, especially from God and from righteous people, whether they're rebels or where they really receive what God wants to give them. Correction is good, because no one knows everything, especially young people. I don't think they know everything, but they don't. 
So correction and judgment is important in the life of humans. Do you have a question, lady? Okay, so. I don't see how any of us here, you're no better, I'm no better than anyone else, only because of Jesus will say we all deserve hell. Well, if you mean we're no better in the sense that we have committed sin, I agree with that. But if you mean you're still living that way, I don't agree with that. Christians have been delivered from sin, they live a holy life. And so, in that sense, I am better, but I'm not here proclaiming my goodness or how much better I am than somebody else. I'm simply declaring the facts. I was a lot of these things. Okay? But I. No, I don't mess up every day. That's not true. Well, people do sin all the time. I agree with that. But I'm not one of those people. Okay? No. Christians who live holy lives. What does repentance mean? That's not repentance. Repentance is not acknowledging as wrong. It's not saying you're sorry. Repentance is turning away from it. Okay, so if, if you're turning away from it every day and you're turning back to it, you're just walking around in circles. That's all you're doing. If you're turning away from sin and turning back to it the same day or the next day, all you're doing is walking in circles. You're never progressing in the faith. God calls you to repentance completely, forsaking it, never going back to it. No, you, you're telling me you're doing it every day, all day, every day. No, but Christian people make mistakes, and they sin. Well, sin is not a mistake. A mistake is like 2 plus 2 equals 5 on a test. That's a mistake. Tripping over a crack in the sidewalk's a mistake. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting something. That's a mistake. Sin is rebellion. Sin is breaking God's law. It's not a mistake. Sin is willful rebellion against God. But I'm saying even after people accept Jesus into your heart, it doesn't mean you don't ever sin again. Well, I didn't say that. I didn't say that Christians don't have the ability to sin. I'm saying Christians live a holy life. They live in victory. And if they sin, not when, they're not doing it every day, that's to continue to defeat that perpetual victory. If they, if they sin, they have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. They must repent. I just think the goal should not be to make us so divided that no one will know what we're doing. I'm going to make anyone divided. They're already divided. Jesus is already divided. Them. Righteous from unrighteous. I mean, all the this is, this is what the Bible says. I, sh I shouldn't preach what the Bible says? No. Well, you're wrong because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I'm preaching the Word of God. And if they mix that hearing with faith and believe, they will be saved. That's the only way they can be saved. Okay, well, you didn't hear the Word of God? You didn't hear the Word of God when you got saved? I did. Okay, well, that's what I'm preaching, the Word of God. It sounds to me like you fear man more than you fear God. You care more about people's feelings than you do what God says. I'm not here to cater to your feelings. I'm not here to make you feel good about yourself. I'm here to tell you the truth. The truth is, if you're a sinner, you're in danger. And if you were in a five-story dorm room building and you were on the fifth floor, and the fire was on the first floor, you would want someone to warn you. They wouldn't come up and tell you, well, listen, hey, let's, let's have some fun. Let's go out and play some baseball, or some football, or some soccer. They'd be warning you. There'd be seriousness and sobriety in their voice. There'd be danger. They'd want to help you understand there's danger outside. And if you rejected and neglected what they were saying, they might get even more passionate and compassionate about their warnings because they care for your soul. And you wouldn't be, so much be concerned about the tone of their voice or their body language or even the exact words they're using to warn you when you realize what danger you are in and how much love they have for you to go up to the fifth floor and warn you when there's a fire on the first floor, you would, if I would hope, if you cared about your life, you would run from that building as quickly as you could. And when a professing Christian tells me I shouldn't put what the Bible says on a sign to show people what the Bible says on a sign, there's something wrong with that person's heart. Something wrong. I'm not ashamed of God's word. 
She said, if you're ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous, sinful generation of you, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. She said, if you want to come after me, you must not deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels shall save it. And what should a profit a man if he gained the whole world and loses his own soul in the end? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And then he says, if you are ashamed of me and my words, this adulterous and sinful generation, of you, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Proverbs 29 says, the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. See, so many people, especially professing Christians, they are fearing man, they are ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know how I know that? Because they never share it. And when they see someone else sharing it, they're ashamed of that person. And they want to correct that person and tell them they're wrong. Well, they don't even do it themselves. It's a good thing I don't obey you, I obey Jesus. You know, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible describes the, the spreading of God's word like the spreading of seeds and the parable of the sower. In the parable of the sower, the one who is spreading God's word is spreading his, the seeds of God's word all over the place. Someone falls into concrete, hard ground. It doesn't go in. He doesn't go over there and take a sledgehammer to the, the ground first and try to get it broken up so he can put the seed in there and grow something. He just throws the seed indiscriminately. Throws the seed of the word of God out. Sometimes it'll hit good soil. Sometimes it'll hit hard ground. Sometimes it'll hit bad soil. The soil in that parable, the parable of the sower, is the state of men's hearts. I don't determine the state of your heart. You determine that yourself, whether you have a soft heart toward the word of God or have a hard heart towards God's word. You have that distinction. You make that decision for yourself. All I do is preach the word of God. I sow the seed of the word of God. It's your choice whether you receive it or not. When you stand before God, if you haven't turned from your sin, if you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ, you won't be able to say, well, that guy, he wasn't, he wasn't real nice when he was sharing the word of God that one day. You know, he wasn't doing it the right way. That's why I didn't believe in Jesus. Do you really think God's going to listen to that? Do you really think God's going to receive that as a legitimate excuse on Judgment Day? And say, oh, you're right. He didn't know what he was doing. Just forget about him. Come on in. It's not the way God is. God is perfect in justice, and you have no excuse ever for your sin, even if I never showed up, even if I never came out here and preached the Word of God, nobody else did. You still have enough knowledge, have enough understanding, you have a conscience given to you by God. You can look around you and see there's a Creator God who created everything we see. You have enough knowledge to cause you to seek after more. But instead of seeking after more knowledge and understanding of who God is and what He's like, you seek after sin. And that will be the detriment to your soul. You seek after sin instead of Jesus, instead of God. But if you seek after God with all your heart, he shall be found by you. And I said earlier, he's not playing hide and seek with you. Well, in Acts 17, is not far from any one of us. So God calls you. God calls all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. You can shake your head all you like. You can disagree all you like. I don't care. And God doesn't care about disagreement either. Those who believe, that's who will get converted. The same people the Bible talks about. Well, this is what the Bible teaches. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's not unloving to do what I'm doing. This is love. Keeping your mouth shut is not love. That's hatred. Not telling people the whole truth is hatred. That's not love. 
Oh, well, I never called anyone a nasty person. But everybody is a sinner. You don't believe that? No, I do. So then what's the problem with telling people that? So the Bible says, all have sinned. They're going to show the glory of God. The Bible says that. Why can't I tell them that? No, that's, that absolutely is the main part of the gospel. How are they going to know they need to be saved? Let's know what they need to be saved from. Would you give a, a cancer patient the cure to cancer when they don't even know they have cancer? Wouldn't make any sense to them. You wouldn't give a cancer patient the cure to cancer. So I don't have cancer. You'd show them all the signs of their cancer first and then to give them the cure to cancer. So you've got to show a sinner all their sins and what they need to be saved from, and then you offer them a solution, which is Jesus Christ. It's not fear-mongering, and it's not about your feelings either. Okay? It's not about your feelings. It's about the truth of God's Word. Put aside your feelings. Obey God instead. We don't live by feelings. We live by faith. A Christian lives by faith, not by feelings. Faith in God's Word. Trust in love with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. That's what the Bible teaches. So I live by faith, not by feelings. Okay? So it's not about feelings. What? Okay, whatever. It's not about me being better than you. You can make all the accusations you want of fear mongering, me thinking I'm better than you and I'm turning people away. All the same nonsense all fake Christians like to say. The fact is, you just fear man. If you love God and you love man, and you fear God and you love man, you would do what God says. And God says, preach the word in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Got a question? I'm not going to bite. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'm here to answer questions. Don't forget to read the other side, too. As I'm here to declare the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity but towards you, goodness, if you continue in this goodness. As Jesus Christ died for you, if I was in Isaiah 53, he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. So you want peace, it's available to you through the chastisement of Jesus, through what he went through. If you'll turn from your sin and turn to him by faith, you can have peace with God through the chastisement of Jesus. And he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. So Jesus died for your sins. Is that your IQ? Or am I your number one preacher? It's amazing how students think flipping me the middle finger is going to hurt my feelings and make me go cry in a corner and go away. Not the way it works. Like water off a duck's back. Jesus has sent his people into the world with faces like flint to declare unto you the word of God. Take more than that to make them go away. And probably the two most anointed preachers who ever, who ever will live, besides Jesus, of course, will come in the last days. They are called the two witnesses. And the Bible in Revelation 11 talks about them prophesying for three and a half years. And it says that they tormented those who live on the earth. And after three and a half years when their testimony was finished, they were killed by the beast that came out of the bottomless pit. And it says that people made merry and gave themselves gifts over their death. So be warned. In the last days, the first half of the last seven years before Jesus returns, there'll be two witnesses who will come and preach from Jerusalem. Elijah and most likely the Apostle John. And they will declare things and it will torment people, the things they declare. And when they die, people will make a holiday out of it and give each other gifts. 
and they'll let they'll let they won't even do these men the respect of burying them. They'll just let their bodies just sit there in the street dead. But after three and a half days, they'll actually rise from the grave, and people will be afraid again. But God calls them back up to heaven, and won't let them torment the earth any longer. That's the kind of preacher I want to be like. Those are the two most anointed preachers who will ever walk the face of the planet besides Jesus. It's the two witnesses in the last days. You know, one, people, one thing that people like to mock about the Bible is, the, is prophecy, the last things. It's called eschatology. You won't be laughing when you see these things start to come to pass. Wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, nation rise against nation, false prophets, false Christ, false teachers are rising in many places. The whole world hating Christians and turning against them. Christians but becoming non-Christians, betraying other Christians to death. Even family members betraying, betraying other family members to death. But the Christians continue to preach the gospel until the end when Jesus returns. Beware, you'll see in the last days, seven years before Jesus' return, you'll see a man, his name will be the Antichrist. He will make a covenant with the nation of Israel, a seven-year covenant. But halfway through that covenant, he will break it. And he will go into the third temple, which is not yet even built yet. He'll go into the third temple of the Jewish people and do despicable and abominable things there. Be warned. I'm warning you ahead of time. These things are written in the scriptures. And these things are written for your benefit. That when they come to pass, you will know Jesus Christ in the future. And his holy apostles and prophets who wrote down the scriptures knew the future. And it's, it's to get you to repent, really. Because what good does it do you to have this information, to have this knowledge, understanding, but then continue to walk in sin and obey what you do know? The Bible talks about Jesus coming as a thief in the night when he does return. He comes as a thief in the night, not for everybody as a thief, but for the wicked as a thief. Why? Because they're not watching, they're not waiting, they're not prepared for his return. But those who are followers of Jesus, they're reading the scripture, they're living holy lives. As it gets closer to the end, they begin to understand things more clearly when it comes to the end times. And they will not be surprised. They will not be a thief. They will be like the five wise virgins who are watching and waiting, who have their lamps full of oil. They're not surprised, taken back when Jesus returns. That's what it will be like for those who are righteous, watching, waiting, and praying. Which are you, righteous or unrighteous? Jesus said the Son of Man will send out his angels. Jesus, Jesus is the Son of Man, by the way. He will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. See, you've got to listen. Those pieces of flesh on the side of your head that collect sounds and bring it into your brain. Listen. Pay attention to the word of God. Read the word of God for yourself. Don't be deceived. The Bible says, because lawlessness will abound, sin will abound in the last days, the love of most will grow cold. We see it happen even now. There's lack of love between humans, whether it's because of their political affiliation or because of their, the color of their skin, the shade of their skin. There's a lack of love between human beings. And that lack of love will continue to grow because lawlessness will abound. Sin abounds all around us. And therefore, the love of most will grow cold. You got to keep your love hot, your love warm, your love on fire for people and for Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. Stay close to the Father. Read the Word. Stay in prayer. 
That's the only way you'll keep your love hot. It's the only way you won't begin to hate people and despise people. Because people aren't the real enemy. The real enemy is the devil. The people oftentimes are used by him. But people, human beings, aren't the real enemy. The Bible says we don't, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Against principalities and powers. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and have done all to stand. So you've got to have on the eyes of Jesus, the mind of Christ, to see people through his eyes so you won't treat them like your true enemy and start to not love them, start to hate them. Simply because of their political affiliation or their religious affiliation, or the color or shade of their skin. That's not a reason to not like somebody. God loves all. And his followers ought to love all as well. And as, as I said earlier, loving all people does not mean you approve of everything they do or accept everything they do or say that everything they do is righteous or agree with them on everything. That is not love. Love can disagree. Love can tell someone they're wrong. Love can be intolerant towards wickedness. That's not a lack of love to do those things. But it is a lack of love to hate somebody, to want bad for them, to not tell them the truth. That's a lack of love. If you truly love someone, you will tell them the truth. If you truly love someone, you will not want harm to come to them. You will want what is best for them. You will tell them the truth whether they like it or not. That's what true love does. Jesus said, no greater love has any man than this than to lay his life down for his friends. So true love is sacrificial. I said love is patient, suffers long, is kind, does not behave rudely, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. These are some characteristics of love. So the question you ask yourself today is, do you love God? If you love God, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. As Jesus said in John 14, 15. If you love Jesus, you'll keep his commandments, the Bible says. The Bible says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And it must, must go in that order. So you get it backwards, you'll end up having a false definition, a false idea of what love is, and you'll quote-unquote love people in the wrong way by being tolerant of all their wickedness, not telling them they're wrong, not telling them the truth. But if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that is first, that's the first greatest commandment the Bible teaches, then your love for others will be based upon their love for God. And God will teach you. Through prayer and through the Word of God, He'll teach you how to love other people. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to understand what it means to love somebody else how to love other people. Because love wants the greatest good for somebody. Love does no harm. Jesus said, you must be born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God. Whether to be in the kingdom of God, you want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. You must repent of all sin. Give up all sin. Lust porn watching, drunkenness, drug use, idolatry, covetousness, lying, sexual immorality. You must give it all up and follow Jesus if you want eternal life. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life. 
those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. That's what God's Word teaches. It will become of you. Your eternity means more than your fragile life you're living right now. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Man who was born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Friends, trust in Christ. Turn to Jesus. In faith, in repentance, and obedience, turn to Jesus.